Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. So good, good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, our AUA and SUO symposium on the role of PARP inhibitors in advanced prostate cancer. As I mentioned, the symposium is brought to you by the American Logic Association in cooperation with the SUO. And our intent tonight is to review the role of PARP inhibitors as a class of drugs and the evidence around it for advanced prostate cancer. We're going to reinforce some of the key points also that are in the uh, new AUA slash SUO guidelines for advanced prostate cancer. Our goals are to review the recommended criteria for genetic testing in patients with advanced disease, to explain the role of PARP inhibitors in carcinogenesis, in PARP, the PARP in carcinogenesis, and in their, of their inhibitors in cancer treatment, to talk about some of the evidence behind the use of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer, and some of the therapeutic choices that we're going to be offering to our patients. The AUA strives to offer outstanding educational courses and greatly appreciates your evaluations. There'll be some, um, some for you to do at the end and your feedback to continually make the programs better. Some of the AUA staff members, I looked at her earlier, um, Helen Schofield is in the back. If you have any concerns or anything else you wanna to bring to her attention, she's wearing the uh, uh, zip up that says AUA. Your name badges are required for the meeting attendees. This is your ticket into the session and it kind of verifies your registration. I'm Dr. Ashley Ross, I'm, I'm a urologic oncologist uh, here at Northwestern, and I'm joined tonight by, by two of my colleagues, uh, both from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, next to me is, is Dr. Kristen Scarpato. She's an associate professor at, at Vanderbilt, and she's the director of their residency program. She's a urologic oncologist who focuses on genitourinary malignancies, prostate cancer, and, and bladder, um, and additionally, she has a large role in, in education. She's in the SUO's educational committee. She's part of the AUA's uh, core curriculum as well. Dr. Davis, to my far left, is, a, uh, is the head of urologic oncology um, for genital urinary malignancies at Vanderbilt. Her research focuses on genital urinary malignancies, and she's an expert in, in prostate cancer as well as other GU malignancies. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, um, Dr. Scarpato, for joining us tonight. A couple more housekeeping things. We want to make a big, a big thank you to Pfizer. Pfizer gave a, um, an independent educational grant to support this symposium. Um, and then finally, just to talk a little bit about the um, audience response um, system. Um, that's a system that you can run on your, on your phone or, or other device. Instructions are located at your, at your table. If you scan the QR code, uh, it will take you to the, um, to the pretest questions that will begin just in a minute or so. Beyond that, we'd ask that you keep your phones on vibrate throughout the, uh, throughout the pr program. So with, with that, um, we're gonna get started. We're gonna start out by going through some of the pretest questions. You're gonna have the same questions at the end of the uh, symposium to test your knowledge. So you can scan your QR codes and that should take you into the pretest. So we're going to start with the first question. I'll read the question and, the, and I'll read also the, the, the answers for you. So the guidelines for advanced prostate cancer recommend offering germline testing to men with prostate cancer of which stages and states? A, men considering active surveillance. B, men with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. C, men with cash rate resistant prostate cancer. D, Choices A, B, and C, so all the above, or E, men with metastatic hormone sensitive or metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer. And we'll give you a little bit of time to log your responses. And for the first question, maybe a few extra minutes just so people can log in. Oops. Great, so we'll move on to the next question. Second question is severe, meaning like grade three adverse events and above for PARP inhibitors, include all the following with the exception of anemia requiring transfusion, thrombocytopenia, nausea, 
transaminitis, or neuropathy. We'll give you a moment to log your, your answers. Wonderful. We'll go on to the next question. Which of the following is the most plausible rationale for synergy between PARP inhibitors and down, and down regulation of androgen signaling? Is it A, that AR splice variants are inhibited by PARP inhibition? B, that clinical resistance to AR signaling inhibitors like ENZA, abiraterone, or apalutamide or darolutamide occurs through the activation of RB1 and BRCA2? Is it C, that inhibition, inhibition of the androgen receptor decreases expression of genes associated with DNA damage response? Or is it D, all of the above? Wonderful. For the next question, which therapeutic combination has not been tested or shown to um, enhance progression-free survival for men with metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer and homologous repair deficiencies? Is it talizoprib and enzalutamide, olaparib plus abiraterone, niraparib plus apalutamide, or niraparib plus abiraterone? Wonderful. And at the end of this session, I think everyone will have mastery of these. Um, but the last question being, what best describes um, men that might have a likely response to PARP inhibition when combined with androgen receptor signaling inhibitors? Is it A, that the synergy of drugs in these regimens allows for response among all men, regardless of their genetics? Is it B, men with mutations and homologous recombination repair deficiencies, regardless of the gene, will have high responses? Is it C, that men with mutations in BRCA1 or 2 are most likely to respond? Or is it D, that men who are, who are MSI high or have microsatellite instability will have the best responses to combinational therapies using PARP inhibitors? Great, and thank, thank you all for going through those questions with us. So now we'll get, we'll, get into the, we'll get into the symposium again, talking about PARP inhibitors and advanced prostate cancer. You know, Dr. Davis, PARP inhibitors are not a new class of drug, but they're relatively new um, with their evidence for efficacy and FDA approval, as well as guideline endorsement in prostate cancer. Can you tell us a bit about PARP inhibitors as a class and their mechanism of action? Oh, can you can you hear? Can they can they turn on her her mic? She's probably mic number three. Hmm. I don't hear you. 
Do y'all hear me? Can you hear me now? This connectors. Go ahead and talk. How about now? Oh, yeah. So again, the, just to rehash, we're talking about what are, what's the mechanism of action yeah, of PARPs so, in the Thank you. So, so PARPs themselves um, are a class of enzymes, and they function to not only detect DNA damage, but also to recruit uh, proteins to fix DNA damage within cells. So that being said, this is a very attractive mechanism in cancer to inhibit. Because if we throw, as the medical oncologist, if we throw chemotherapy or other anti-cancer drugs into the body and, and disrupt this DNA, we don't want it fixed. We don't want the cells to be able to recruit damage repair genes and fix it. So by using PARP inhibitors, we can do, uh, we can inhibit the cancer cell's ability to repair itself and it there, therefore breaks. There's two major ways this happens. One is through trapping of PARP itself, so the, it, the PARP inhibitors bind to the sites that the, the PARP enzymes normally would utilize to recruit genes to, uh, I'm sorry, proteins to fix the cells. And so by trapping the PARP, it can't let go and it can't get these proteins in to repair the cells. The other way of doing it is through synthet synthetic le lethality, and this is how, how we think about it in prostate cancer. The men that have DDR mutations, gene mutations, already have damaged repairability. Um, so it, by adding a PARP inhibitor, we're kind of hitting it both ways. It's kind of a two-hit hypothesis. We're blocking PARP from being able to try to repair. And in the men with these DDR mutations, they already have a damaged system. So it irre irreparably mangles it, if you will. Yeah, the, um, you know, and, and Dr. Scarpato, you know, as, as Dr. Davis was mentioning, you know, theoretically, probably most effective in people who already have DNA damage repair deficiencies. How common is DNA damage repair deficiency, um, mu you know, mutations that cause that in advanced prostate cancer? We're certainly learning more about these mutations and how common it is, and that's reflected in the guidelines. The data are somewhat variable, but somewhere between 1 to 5 percent of the general population may have a mutation in these DDR genes, and then um, upwards of 15 to 25 percent of patients who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer will harbor these mutations, which is why they make great targets for our advanced therapies and why it is recommended that we screen for these mutations. Yeah, and the, you know, indeed, when, when I think about other cancers, even prostate cancer, the, the biggest synergies with, with PARP are with specifically DNA damage response genes that have to do with homologous recombination. We often think about BRCA one and BRCA2. And as Dr. Scarpato mentioned, and, and you may have all seen and as the guidelines have just recently updated and come out, they're really emphasizing testing our patients who have advanced prostate cancer, hormone sensitive, or if they haven't been tested then at metastatic castrate resistant disease um, so that we can identify people who might be eligible for these, for these therapies. So, you know, Dr. Davis, you mentioned, you know, part, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I just want to make one, one comment about that. Um, you know, as a urologist, some of you may wonder, well, why, why do I need to learn about PARP inhibition and these medications? And we are seeing these patients earlier on oftentimes, and it is recommended in the non-advanced cancer state for certain patients to have um, genetic testing. And so patients who are high risk or very high risk or those with certain family histories and certain pathology like cribriform, um, we may be detecting these earlier on and then we're following these patients for quite a long time. Those who do go on to develop advanced disease, you know, we're sort of co-managing oftentimes with our um, medical oncology colleagues, but we're, we're, we can be the point of entry. And so knowing that these guidelines are in place and knowing which patients to test 
Um, and we'll get into a little bit more about that in, in a minute, but um, we, we kind of play an, an important role in, in this early stage testing as well as in the advanced testing. And there is, you know, we may have time for this, we may not. I, in my practice, and I'll ask you, know, you and also Dr. Davis what they do, you know, originally when it came to genetic testing, um, I sometimes would refer to a genetic counselor. Um, now I've, I've mostly taken the approach where I'll order the testing um, if I see a likely pathogenic variant or a pathogenic variant, then I will send them to the genetic counselor. Is that fairly similar to what you both were doing in your practices? Or? Yeah, I, I think before, a few years ago, we were doing the exact same thing as sending it to genetic counseling, and there aren't enough of them, really. I mean, I'm sure you all have sent your patients and, oh, a first available appointment is nine months from now. Um, that's just not timely. It's just not practical. So we do point-of-care testing in actually in the urology clinic as well as the medical oncology GU clinic. Um, and then if we see a pathogenic variant, uh, we will yep. in, uh, kind of get expedited genetic yeah. counseling. You know, I don't, we I don't already think, have something. Totally agree. And I don't think that genetic counseling needs to be the hurdle here. All of us understand what the guidelines say, and I think we have a general understanding of the implications of finding a pathogenic variant. And that amount of counseling is appropriate. Patient then can be sent to have the test. And then if there is a variant um, that is found, either a pathogenic variant or a variant of uncertain or unknown significance, then we can refer our patients for, for genetic counseling. But not having direct access is not necessarily a reason not to to yeah, order and, the tests and many of, and many of the different genetic tests that are out there. If we if we don't have genetic counselors, the actually the companies that offer them often have online genetic counselors that can do it remotely. So that's an option. You know, as we're going to talk about tonight, the patients that have, and as Dr. Davis suggested, a lot of the cancers that are more aggressive jettison some of their rate repair machinery so that they won't be kind of encumbered by having to fix their DNA as they proliferate. And so a lot of our, our men that have BRCA2 loss will actually have worse prognostic outcomes by themselves, but they also will have the highest treatment response. And because most of these drugs like we're going to discuss are currently second lines in the CRPC space, first line sometimes, uh, we need to know who they are early so we can be ready you know, for our medical oncologists to, to help us out or if we're treating them in our own practices with things like PARP inhibitors. So just bringing it back, Dr. Davis, you know, there's this class of PARP inhibitors but there's multiple drugs that we're going to talk about tonight in that class. Um, you know, are, are all of them the same? You mentioned PARP trapping. Are there, what are the differences? They're, they essentially do the same function, but they're at, just like there are different PARPs. There's PARP 1, PARP 2, PARP 3, PARP 3, et cetera. They, they block differently, and they have different affinity for trapping the PARP. So uh, Olaparib and Rucraparib have similar PARP trapping abilities. Uh, Talazoparib, as I, I think Dr. Scarpata may mention, is a hundred times higher affinity in terms of trapping PARP. Now, the caution with that is that doesn't necessarily correlate with more efficacy at this point. We don't know that that um, equals more efficacy, but, but it has a higher ability to trap PARP. So similar mechanisms of actions, do they also share as a class like any similar toxicities? They do, and, and some of that um, also goes along with which PARPs they do inhibit more. Um, we know that the higher PARP trapper, so talazoparib, tends to have higher hematologic toxicities associated with it. But in general, GI, hematologic toxicities, fatigue, um, we can see some transaminitis, elevated creatinine can be a problem. Um, and I, I would say the number one I see in my practice is, is the myelosuppression, yeah. mostly anemia, but you can see neutropenia uh, as well as thrombocytopenia. Um, typically, only transfusions are needed for, for anemia, though. And, you know, Dr. Scarpato, we're going to get into this at depth, but in general, how have the PARP inhibitors been investigated in advanced prostate cancer? Um, they have been investigated, at least initially, in patients with... Um, metastatic CRPC who have progressed through other therapies. And so, um, and, and that is part of the reason why I think initially urologists weren't maybe as, as heavily involved because these were patients who were really pretreated. But now, as we're going to talk about, there may be a role for them earlier on in, um, 
in CRPC. Yeah, and, and certainly the first the first FDA approvals, like for Olaparib, was you know after the people on the trolleys have gone through several lines of therapy. It was a mono agent, and then the Rucaparib approval, which we'll talk about later as well, um, that is also in the CRPP setting. And most often, the patients that had seen other lines of therapy, um, including um, chemotherapy for many of them. But there's also um, new trial evidence and, and you know, evidence behind combination of PARP inhibitors with, I'll say as a class, we'll call them androgen receptor signaling uptake, signaling inhibitors, which is your AR blockers, your enzalutamide, darolutamide, apalutamide, and then also some of your like CYP1720 lias inhibitors like abiraterone. What's the rationale, Dr. Scarpato, that, that PARP and these AR sort of signaling blockers would work together? It's, it's based on preclinical data that there may be some synergism between the androgen receptor therapies and, and PARP. And I don't think we exactly know the mechanism, but we do know that the um, androgen receptor is involved in DNA repair. And it is thought that perhaps the androgen receptor um, create, when you, when you block that with ART, AR, androgen receptor therapy, that you kind of induce this um, BRCA-ness, if you will. And so the ability to create kind of a new synthetic lethality that Dr. Davis was talking about may be enhanced when you're using these in combination. And certainly some of the, the preclinical data suggests that the outcomes are better. And now the clinical data may be suggesting that. But to kind of go back for a second to um, how we kind of classify these, I think of things um, in different buckets or different, different groups. So you have monotherapy or combination therapy. You have um, after prior therapy, like the original approvals that we'll talk about, and then you have first line, and then you have those who are selected with HR mutations and potentially those who are not. And I, I kind of categorize the different, different agents and possible ways to use them uh, in those buckets. And I know there's a lot of debate, somewhat heated debate, if anyone went to GU ASCO about um, some of these different parameters and what matters and what, and what doesn't. But um, in general, there are kind of these large, large groupings. And, and that's an excellent framing. And so just for the, for the group that's with us and the group online, you know, thus far in this symposium, what we want to drive home is A, you know, PARP inhibitors have a lot of evidence now for use in advanced prostate cancer, and we'll talk about whether that's in all patients or selected patients, but a lot of evidence. There's certainly very strong evidence that they can be efficacious in people with homologous recombination deficiency, certainly BRCA1 and 2 mutated patients. So as urologists, which a lot of the room is, is urologists, but it certainly as medical colleagues as well and other practitioners, when we see a patient that is you know, that prostate cancer is one of their major life problems or potentially their life problem that will cause lethality, we want to, screen, we want to check their genetics and see how we can line them up for future therapies. So that we should do it in advanced prostate cancer patients, we should be doing genetic testing. The second part is that PARP inhibitors have activity both in single agent and in combination, and it depends on which line of therapy, just as Dr. Scarpato was framing, that part's a little bit more complicated, so we're gonna walk through that more slowly. And so, Dr. Davis, I think the easiest thing is to talk about the monotherapy data first. So that's the, the two FDA-approved drugs as monotherapies are Olaparib and Rucaparib, as we've, as we've mentioned. So the trials behind that were called Profound, and then Triton 3 just came out. Can you talk a little bit about patient selection for the trials, what line of therapy, as, as Dr. Scarpato said, their oncological outcomes, and what are the toxicities seen as those mono agents? Yeah, sure. Um, profound came along first, and Profound was for metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients who had progressive disease despite one f f uh, prior newer hormonal therapy, so abiraterone or enzalutamide uh, primarily. This was a randomized phase three study, and it was randomized two to one. Um, so two patients would get a lap rib for every one patient that got either enzalutamide or abiraterone, whatever they had not already had. Um, and there were two cohorts in this study as well. And cohort A was limited to those with BRCA1 or two mutations and ATM mutations. Cohort B had all of the above, 
they could have had BRCA1 or 2 or ATM, but they also um, had one of 12 other pre-specified mutations. So kind of the things we don't think about as much, the Paul B2 and CHECK2 and things like that, that looked attractive at the time. Um, the primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival uh, for cohort A, so the BRCA1, 2, and ATM um, groups. Patients, uh, the dosing was the typical dosing from the TOPART-B trial, uh, the 300 BID of Olaparib, and what they found was that the Olaparib and the intent to treat, so the all-comers, all three subgroups, um, outperformed statistically significantly the control arm, the newer hormonal therapy um, in the progression-free survival, also in median overall survival. When they teased out just the BRCA1-2 groups, there was actually an increased radiographic progression-free survival by about a month longer, so about 11 months versus six and a half months. Um, the whole group was about 10, 10 months from six and a half months. They also sort of pulled out ATM, um, but that was better, but not statistically significant. So not a lot was made out of that. We don't know what to do from that study. We don't really know that we should or should not use Elaparib um, in ATM-mutated patients. And, and this led, I think, to the first FDA approval for PARP inhibitors in metastatic prostate cancer. And it was metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer. And like you said, for patients who had seen previous, you know, second generation, let's call it, right. like enzalutamide or, or abiraterone. You know, Dr. Scarpato, the, a similar trial, uh, well, let's say similar, but another trial was the Triton 3 study that used Recaprib. If you want to talk a little bit about it, um, that'd be Sure. Good. Yeah, I'll start with the, the Triton 2, if, if you don't mind. So, sure. um, <laughs> the Triton 2 similarly enrolled patients who had metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer and had been treated with abiraterone or enzalutamide and chemotherapy, taxane chemotherapy, and also had um, homologous recombination repair gene mutations. And these patients received rucaparib um, versus physician's choice, so um, another novel hormonal agent. And um, we again see radiographic progression-free survival, which is a common endpoint in these studies as the, the primary endpoint. There were three cohorts in this trial. Um, and the first cohort was looking at patients who had BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and then measurable disease on imaging, either um, metastatic disease or lymphadenopathy. Then the second uh, cohort was looking at also those same mutations without measurable disease. And then the third cohort was looking at other mutations um, without, with or without any measurable disease. And we see in, in this trial um, favorable duration of response and response in the Rucaparib group that led to this expedited approval from a phase two trial. Um, then this went on for um, a phase three trial, which was just published, that Dr. Ross just mentioned, um, that looked again at Rucaparib as monotherapy. One of the primary differences here was that patients um, did not have to receive prior docetaxel or prior taxane chemotherapy um, to be enrolled, but we see similarly uh, positive uh, radiographic progression-free survival results for patients who had mutations, particularly the BRCA mutations. And, and then, Dr. Davis, if you, if you want to, you talked a little bit about toxicities, you know, again, like, what were the, how well tolerated was the PARP and, and uh, PARP inhibitors in these trials? And what, and the, you mentioned them before, but I'll have you mention the toxicity yeah. of PARP inhibitors again. Yeah, the biggest toxicities were, again, myelosuppression, primarily anemia. Um, this tends to occur early when it happens, and over time can subside. So it's more important early on to follow the blood counts when you first start the patients on these drugs um, because they may need, may need transfusions. Now I would say that you know a lot of the patients in Profound, in Triton 3, had been more heavily pretreated. So as we go along and, and we talk about using these drugs earlier, we may see less overall need for transfusion. How, how often are you checked? So if you start someone on a PARP inhibitor, so we have our index patient, like they 
now progressed to metastatic CRPC. You've, they've already been pre-screened. They have a BRCA2 mutation, so they fall well within. And you start them on serolaparib or rucaparib. Um, how often are you checking labs? Every month for the first few months? Every three months? What are you doing? So, again, I'm the, I'm the weird one in the room. I'm medical oncology. So I actually bring them in in a week, a week to 10 days to check. Um, and I'm more concerned about telozoparib causing more myelosuppression because it has that higher affinity for PARP trapping. Um, the other thing is if your patient has had prior pelvic radiation, they're going to have more trouble with myelosuppression um, because their bone marrow has already been affected. So usually I bring them in a week, 10 days, and then spread out the visits. Perfect. And urologists can be an important part of detecting side effects in these patients. We regularly interface with them as well, and multidisciplinary care is kind of the name of the game in advanced prostate cancer, and so uh, Dr. Davis and I will, will share patients, and I think listening to your patients and what they have to say about how they're feeling and knowing what therapies they're on, just because I'm not necessarily pres prescribing the medication doesn't mean that this is not an opportunity for me to call Dr. Davis and say, hey, or send the patient to the emergency department, especially given that this can be an older population that's heavily pretreated. Um, the agent, it, it, both, all of these agents are, are orally administered as you, as you heard about and have relatively um, favorable um, side effects, but they're not perfect and patients can have extreme um, can have extreme anemia and thrombocytopenia, and so we are all should be vigilant about assessing these patients. And, and I, I thank you, Dr. both of you, but Dr. Davis, for giving us your cadence, because a lot, in community practice, I know a lot of my partners in, in LUGPA and, and whatnot, they are the ones giving the PARP inhibitor, and it's a new <laughs> class of drugs to them, and it's nice to have in your mind, you know, how early, you know, should you be looking at it, and and certainly I would encourage for providers that are using these drugs, and it's the first time they're using this class of drugs, if anything, to, to overdo it a little bit until the comfort level is there, and, and some very thoughtful comments about previous pelvic radiation. So, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Scarpato, the, 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 and Dr. Davis, in the Triton 3 trial and in Profound, even some of the data up to that, you know, the biggest um, effects most consistently have been seen in the BRCA1 and 2 patients. But you know, there's, there's a want, particularly for people who are in further lines of therapy and you're not quite sure you know, what's their best option, to pull in you know, more patients into the mix, either with other homologous recombination deficiencies or, or DNA damage repair deficiencies, or perhaps even patients that have no, no mutational status. Um, there's been around you know, three reported trials that I could think of that are in later phase for this, you know, Propel, Magnitude, and Talipro. Um, and I guess I'll ask you doc first, Dr. Scarpato, you know, wh what is the, I, I, you know, you told us about the idea there of synergy, but what are those three different regimens, and you don't have to tackle them all, you can share, share the wealth with Dr. Davis, but what are the three different regimens? We'll talk in designs, because the designs, designs of the trials were quite different, and maybe I'll have you just talk about Propel, Magnitude, Talipro regimens, designs, and then we'll go to Dr. Davis to talk about some of the nuances maybe in, in the different trials, but go ahead. Sure. Um, I think one of the big differences in the trial design for each of these, and something that you'll, you'll hear um, hotly debated, is the prospective testing or not of homologous recombination repair genes. Um, so in the PROPEL trial, which was approved by the FDA for you know, the study design, um, they did not test patients for these HRR mutations prior to enrollment. and. And you hear the, the term kind of all comers. So this, this study looked at all comers um, and in the first line setting. So um, patients had not received prior treatment and then were randomized, in this case, um, again to olaparib and abiraterone um, versus um, olaparib and versus abiraterone and placebo. Um, to look for effect, and we see recurrence, uh, radiographic progression-free survival again as an endpoint, at least initially, and then overall survival in some of the mature data. Um, and in the all-comers, we do see that there is a benefit in the, um, the radiographic progression-free survival, RPFS, I might start saying just for, for ease. 
um, and it trends towards significance for overall survival in this first line setting. Um, before jumping onto magnitude, or, or yeah, I think for, like you said, we should summarize it. First line metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer, and you know the combination that was used was abiraterone, prostolaprib, like mm -hmm. you said, and the progression-free survival benefit about hazard ratio. I think it was about like 0.6. Um, in the BRCA cohort, um, if they looked at those guys, um, if I remember correctly, the progression-free survival benefit hazard ratio was like 0.2, so it was like you know five-fold effect. You know, Much more and, impressive. And they could be, and it's possible that they were carrying the show. I mean, in, we we're kind of going to hear this again and again, but I'll just maybe I'll ask Dr. Davis as we're stopping at Propel. You know, how did you look at the data? Like, did it move? You know, it definitely solidified to me that PARP inhibitors are useful for the BRCA mutated CRPC patients. I, and, but, you know, it was a little bit muddied for me in terms of the all comers picture. It, it put it as an option, but, you know, I'm not sure. How did you look at that data when it was reported? Yeah, and, and I think that's where the controversy comes in is, um, you know, patients were randomized without knowing their status. Um, the Talapro study also had non mutated patients on it. It was telazoparib uh, with enzalutamide in patients who had had former abiraterone. Um, and, and so I think, I think it's exciting to see that we can affect the non-mutated patients. Um, I, don't know that, I don't know that that will gain approval in the non-mutated, you know, official approval. Um, so I, I think it's not ready for prime time for the non-mutated patients. I think more follow-up is needed on, on all of those uh, yeah. to really kind of determine whether. Yeah, and, and to, your, to your point, and, and you know, Dr. Scarpato mentioned it earlier, they had sort of different trial designs. It's maybe a good time to bring in the, the, um, you know, the magnitude trial, mm -hmm. which was looking at another drug, Neuraparib, with, with abiraterone. It had a slightly different trial design. And you know, I, I should mention both. I think for for Talapro um, and for the um, for Magnitude, the dosing of the PARP inhibitor had to be adjusted a little bit because of you know um, drug drug interactions. Mm -hmm. But you know, as opposed to Propel and Talapro, which said we're going to take all comers, mm -hmm. you know, Magnitude was a little bit different. And maybe you could talk about the trial design for the Magnitude Neraprib and Olaprib combo. Sure. So uh, again, first line setting here. We're talking about our MRCP, CRPC patients, and in this case, patients um, were enrolled, and then they were stratified by their mutation status, as well as, I believe, site of metastasis and um, any prior therapy that was received in the um, hormone-sensitive space. And then there were um, two, they were randomized to either the niraparib plus abiraterone or niraparib uh, or abiraterone plus placebo, and um, they were then um, they were stratified by their the, importantly the HRR status, and then followed for um, RPFS. We actually uh, interestingly saw that in the non HRR mutated patients, um, th there was futility at the futility analysis. There was no benefit in that cohort. Um, and so that they stopped enrolling in that cohort, but there was a benefit to the HRR mutated patients for this combination therapy. And so, you know, again, I, I, to me, it, it, even though there's differences, you can't really compare PARP to PARP, and even the designs, there's differences, and, you know, it's even been, been brought up that for the, for the near aparib in, in the magnitude study, because the dose reduction, maybe that played a role in efficacy, it's really unclear, but what was clear was, like you said, the, the real bang for your buck is in the, you know, homologous repair recombination deficient patients, particularly BRCA1 and 2. I think, as Dr. Davis mentioned, the ATM data is a little bit muddled. I think there are some patients that will benefit or not. It's, um, before I go into some scenarios, and I'll, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, there are, you know, in ovarian and in other cancers, some have looked further into the genetics to say, well, if you're mutating in one of these non-canonical, you know, sort of uh, homologous combination pathways, do you have scars on your DNA, this thing called like homologous combination deficiency scores and lots of heterozygosity scores that could move the needle one way or another and help you select a patient that 
may, you may or may not be a great responder, but maybe you want to give them a shot. Um, I'm going to get to this later too, but Dr. Davis, say you have a patient like that, so they don't have a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation, you know, not even something that has some more signal like a PAL B2, let's just say they have a RAD51 mutation. So they're in cohort B of the profound that you talked about. They're, they're not, they have a double strand break repair deficiency mutation, and they don't have that many other good options, and you want to try a PARP inhibitor. Um, how do you determine whether the drug is working? You know, do you look for progression? You know, how often are you imaging? Should you see a PSA response? What do you, what do, you do to gauge whether it's, whether it's working? Yeah, PSA is tricky um, late, in the, late in the game for these patients. Um, both the Profound and the Triton 3 had a 50% reduction PSA in only about 45 to 50% of patients, um, despite having radiographic uh, improvement. So, so I look for that first because that's easy. It's a blood test, it's easy to do, it's easy to do frequently. Um, I look for clinical improvement. Is their pain getting better? Is their energy getting, you know, picking up, their appetite picking up? Um, and then, it, it, you know, imaging. Uh, and, and so imaging is, you know, every three months or so or sooner if you need it based on mostly suspicion of things getting worse, um, you look sooner. Yeah, and so I think it follows a lot of the paradigms of like, like obviously, like you said, like clinically, how are they doing? What are you seeing on imaging? Is it progressive disease or not? And and you know, and don't throw the throw the towel in on futility just because the PSA is not having a response. So you know, I thought it might be good to go through some clinical scenarios and walk them through with with you um, both. Um, with some index patients because, and then there's some nuanced questions that nobody, even experts like both of you, have the answer to, but I thought it's a good um, point for discussion. So nowadays, in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, the hope would be that most of our men are seeing ADT and at least one other thing, if not two other things. And so ADT plus ABI, ADT plus docetaxel, ADT plus apalutamide, you know, or um, ADT plus ENZA, or three things, ADT plus ABI plus docetaxel, ADP plus darolutamide plus docetaxel. So let's say a person comes in and they have now progressed through ADT and abiraterone into metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And um, to make it um, somewhat easy, let's say it was a de novo, easier, it's a de novo metastatic patient who had this progression, and there's visible progression. It's not, it's not um, just a biochemical type progression. The urologist, like me and Dr. Scabato, has done a good job, and we've I identified um, the person as um, PARP eligible because they have a BRCA2 mutation. So what is, your, what is your approach? I'll start with Dr. Davis. What's your approach to this BRCA2 pathogenic variant mutated individual now progressing on ADT and abiraterone, and they're now first-line CRPC. So, I mean, your options are Elaparib, because they have had one line of uh, NHT, or chemo, followed by Elaparib, and then, of course, we've now thrown kind of Pluvicto into the mix. Um, so I look at where their metastatic disease is right. and, and how it's affecting them. Um, if they have a liver full of tumor, a lot of visceral disease, I might give them chemo first and then put them on a lap rib, kind of even as a maintenance, um, not as next progression necessarily, which is not the textbook answer and not. Do you, and then the, every, this is different for everyone, but do you, do you reach for, if they haven't seen Taxotere, do you do Taxotere as your chemo or Cisplatin as your, what do you do as your chemo? Uh, so I would usually use Taxotere first and, and after a couple cycles, if they're not responding, I add in Carboplatin. Um, the patients with the DDR mutations do have a heightened sensitivity to platinum-based chemotherapies, but we still aren't using those first and, or as single agents. And then, um, you know, Dr. Scarpato, how would you approach this patient? So it's say, say, you know, you're both at the same institution, but say that there's no medical oncologist, they went on strike. We're and in ASCO. Only... We're, we're in big trouble, guys. <laughs> we're in big trouble. And it's, it's only you. You have this BRCA mutated patient. And let's, let's actually even make it spicier. You know, the way you detected their progression was, you know, you saw progression on bone scan and CT, but you decided you'd get a PET PSMA to see if it's AVID, and they've got, 
you know, pet avid progression, M1C, there's one liver mass, but they still have a lot of bone, you know, disease. And now you're making the decision, you know, is it, is it chemo first? Is it a PARP, you know, and bofrucaparib and uh, olaparib, now a Triton 3 would be allowed in that space? Um, or, you know, are you thinking about another therapy like lutetium PSMA? Gosh, it is so complex. And one of the reasons I love prostate cancer is this complexity and the fact that there are so many options. If you go to our guidelines for, um, and that's what I do, I'm a little dogmatic, but um, if you go to the guidelines for this patient, new diagnosis of M1CRPC, there are a number of different options available. And so honestly, I would consider the patient in front of me what is their performance status? What prior therapy did they receive? Um, and you know, you've already pointed out their BRCA status. Uh, it sounds like this patient's pretty high volume. Um, I think kind of all options are on the table. Um, you know, we we discussed this in in a prior meeting today about a patient who's in the same scenario but received the triplet therapy up front or treatment intensification. So now patients are arriving at M1C RPC having received chemo, novel hormonal therapy, ADT. And does that mean that the door is open for lutetium right away as first line therapy and PARP inhibitors, PARP inhibitors as first line therapy? I do think that the, the data in BRCA mutated patients is really quite strong. So I would at least consider a PARP inhibitor for this patient, um, but you know, I, I don't think that there's a, a right answer. Yeah, there's, there's certainly no right answer, and we'll go into question and answers with the audience. You know, my, you know, again, you know, I mostly do surgery for a living, but you know, my feeling, if they're if they're BRCA one or two, and we'll go into other scenarios too, if they're BRCA one or two mutated, and it's a pathogenic variant, it's a known pathogenic variant. I'm, I'm pretty hot on trying the PARP. And I agree a lot with Dr. Davis. The idea is like, well, will the, you know, if the disease is really escaping, if they're symptomatic and they're symptomatic from disease, chemo might you know, help them right away mm -hmm. and they haven't seen it before. Um, but other, otherwise, you know, I, I think that like I mentioned, like the hazard ratios look so big and, and actually in all these trials, in all the combination therapies and in the, in the non, you know, um, BRCA1, 2, you know, mutated, it looks like the efficacy is really being carried by the BRCA, which is a similar story that we've seen in other cancers. So it should definitely be in your discussion, even, even now with the patient, that's what we, when we all agree with that. You know, um, some envision, you know, for the, the harder question, or maybe, um, or maybe it's easier, is for the person who has a mutation um, in another setting, say uh, um, they have like you know, like I mentioned, like a, like a check two mutation or something like that, um, where it's like a, a weaker cell on the PARP and they have a pet avid lesion, I could imagine thinking about lutetium potentially. And it might, you know, we don't really know all the long-term, when we give it that early, all the long-term side effects of the lutetium even. Um, so here's another, another question. So we, we have that same patient in front of us, they've progressed and say they don't want to do, you know, PARP is chemotherapy, but say they don't want to do IV <laughs> chemotherapy. They want, you know, they want to just do an oral chemotherapy with your PARP agent. And, you know, they've started out with abiraterone and, you know, ADT. There is some evidence that some patients who are progressing and do the switch, it's not that strong from abiraterone to an AR blocker might have some benefit. And now we have some strategies where, you know, like Propel, like Tal I'm sorry, like Talapro, where you're combining Enza with a PARP inhibitor. You know, similarly, we talked about the synergy with Abby, you know, and, you know, Neraparib, Abby, and Olaparib. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts, Dr. Davis? Like, should this person who's progressing, who decided to give a PARP, should you just give the PARP, like Rucaparib or Olaparib, or should you give the PARP in combination with another agent because of the, you might exploit some synergy or maybe even try the Talapro combo because you might get some ends of crosstalk. I think if you're dogmatic like Dr. Scarpato, <laughs> you would do just the part because that's what's FDA approved. Um, so we're all dealing more with peer-to-peers and um, the nightmare of insurance companies trying to dictate what our patients are going to get. Um, in our situation that we're talking about, Elaparib is approved. 
Yeah, and actually, and even like nuanced and baked in there, there are a lot of considerations about, so it's unclear, just for the audience, it's unclear, and back me up on this, if there's any efficacy by adding the androgen receptor signaling inhibitor with the PARP in the thing I'm talking about. They progress with, say, ab ADT. They have a, they have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And let's pretend that every, all the regimens that for the phase three trials get approved. It's unclear that they're going to have a substantial benefit if you now do a combo rather than just the PARP inhibitor. What is clear um, is, even if we could get them, that there's a cost associated with those additional medications. There's drug-drug interactions with those additional medications. And we, we just don't, we don't have that, you know, locked down. You know, one place now, as I mentioned, that most of our patients should be getting at least what I call a doublet therapy at, in the, you know, first-line hormone-sensitive prostate cancer setting, you know, w one place that these combination therapies are, you know, it's nice to know we can give them together if they get FDA approved is, um, is that the patients who, for some reason, did not see that. So progressive to CRPC, um, but they only had ADT alone for one reason or the other. You know, I think those are ideal candidates mm -hmm. to give the combination, you know, therapy for. One question I have kind of along the lines of what um, you're, you're talking about here, and uh, feel free to chime in, but let's say you have someone who progresses on abiraterone <clears throat> and ADT, and you and they have a BRCA mutation, and you're considering starting an agent, would you stop the abiraterone? Yeah, and so, um, you know, my feeling is that they progressed, for me right now, if they're on ABI and ADT and they progressed, and I'm going to put them onto a PARP inhibitor, I would stop the ABI and put them on the PARP inhibitor. Um, but it's definitely not wrong. You know, and it's supported by some evidence mm -hmm. that you could just continue with yeah. a with a doublet. You know, um, and these are one of the things that we have to sort of tease out. Um, we sort of like danced around it a, a little bit. Well, I guess two questions. One for back to toxicities, and then I'll ask Dr. Scarpato another question. But Dr. Davis, for toxicities, what's your threshold for transfusion? I know obviously symptomatic and stuff, but is there like a uh, you know a target hemoglobin that you're going to transfuse if someone's on you know, um, PARP inhibitors. Do you treat through the anemia? Do you, do you hold? It depends on the it depends on the grade and severity, obviously. But just give us some insights as you yeah. roll. Yeah, all of the above. Um, so there are some national guidelines um, in from ASH, American Society of Hematology, about when to transfuse and when not to transfuse. Um, and in general, otherwise healthy, not particularly symptomatic, except, hey, I'm tired, um, you wait until the hemoglobin is less than eight um, or lower. Uh, if they have cardiovascular disease, you can, can and probably should do it a little bit higher, um, keeping it above, above nine, because uh, it will affect that. Depending on the degree and how rapidly the anemia develops um, is how I decide whether to hold the drug for a week and mm -hmm. then dose reduce, um, that sort of thing. If it's been gradually, you know, drifting down, <clears throat> I probably will just dose reduce and not hold it. If it was, you know, nine last week and now at 6.5, in addition to trying to ensure they're not bleeding from somewhere, um, I would probably hold the drug while I transfuse them and make sure they're not bleeding and and then resume at a lower dose. So then there's three other things I want to get through before we talk a little bit about, we wrap up and go back to the questions. You know, one, for Dr. Scarpato, we, we've, been, we've been emphasizing, at least I've been trying to emphasize the BRCA1 and 2 patients because the evidence looks strongest there. But let's take our patient who's progressing. Let's say they're, you know, progressing after triplet therapy. They had like an Aerosense regimen with darolutamide, docetaxel, and ADT and they progressed and they have a Paul B2 mutation. So they're not in that cohort A, Paul B2 mutation. How, would, how do you want to approach your therapeutic choice in the, in the um, you know, non-BRCA patient, um, but still homologous recombination deficiency? Paul B2, I think, has some of the best evidence of the other comers in the, in the cohort B, but would you approach them differently? Would you, would you start thinking about other agents second, uh, next line for them? What's, what's your thoughts? Again, I think it's reasonable to consider all of them. Um, since Paul B does have some response, um, 
I think I would consider if the patient was a good candidate for PARP inhibitors, um, offering a PARP inhibitor in, in that situation. Uh, but, but certainly any of the other agents, particularly if the patient was symptomatic in some regard and had, you know, bony meds, I might consider even layering on um, some radiopharmaceutical therapy. I, I think all of the options, again, are on the table based on the patient in front of you, but I would certainly give PARP consideration with that mutation. Now, Dr. Davis, for the non-HRR mutated patient, you sort of mentioned it before. You said, like, let's just see if the FDA even bites and approves it. But if you could give any regimen you wanted, you know, would you would would a combination regimen using something like you know some kind of AR signaling inhibitor plus a PARP would that be one of your in terms of lines of treatments for your CRPC patient, which sometimes replicates how much you think it's going to work, but sometimes it's you know how beat up the patient is. Are you thinking of that as early on, like this is a good regimen, I'm going to try this up front, or is this like I'm going to save this for if everything else is not working? I that think, would be so Yeah, I think for the non-mutated patient, I would try it early on. Um, oh, interesting. And, and, and because, uh, you know, so our patient progressed yeah. on Abby, um, talazoparib and enzalutamide might be a good option. Right. Enzalutamide by itself is probably not going to do too much right. in that setting, and particularly if they have low-volume visceral disease. Yeah. And it's, an early, it's, an, it's, a, it's an, a very interesting perspective. It's actually kind of opposite of mine. You're saying, well, the patient's not too beat up. They might be able, we might be able to see a response. And if we do, you know, great, we can keep them on this regimen. And if, if not, you know, we'll go on to something else. You know, in my mind, I was thinking like, well, let me try something else on them that might work, you know, even like, you know, if they've already gone through multiple lines, cabazitax or something, and then later on come back to it. But uh, I think yours makes more sense. Yeah, I think it's, it, again, it's, you know, what, what we've learned most, I think, over the past 25 years is that one prostate cancer is not the same as the other. Right. And every patient is different. And, um, and because of the myelosuppression with PARP inhibitors, now that we're using more radium, now that we're using more plavicto, those patients are going to have even more myelosuppression after. Right. Um, we already see that with the lutetium patients having had everything else we've had, both, both chemos, all the um, AR drugs. You know, they're, they're dropping their counts. They're not able to get to the next dose um, because their counts are too low and our nuclear, our nuclear medicine docs won't touch them. And that reminds me, if you don't mind, just of an interesting point. You know, you said not all prostate cancer is the same, and that's very true. We know it's very heterogeneous. But think about the number of ways a patient can arrive at the CRPC state. And so the patients have are all very different, too. You know, you could have a patient who was on ADT monotherapy, hopefully not as much these days, that not, not a great option anymore as we know, or a patient who's had ADT plus androgen receptor targeted therapy, or a patient who's had triplet therapy, or a patient who's just had ADT and chemotherapy. So they as a person and their cancers have been exposed to many different things by the time they arrive at their CRPC state. And so whether or not that has some impact on our treatment. Um, so it's a, it's a good question because now that these are here, you know, there's also the scenario where you've, you know, you have the patients that are not presenting necessarily de novo. Say they've been treated, and then they had oligo progression, so they have low volume, you know, um, hormone sensitive, and then they progress to a low volume castrate resistant setting, you know, um, and potentially even a pet pet positive only castrate resistant, you know, setting. Um, you know, that's still pretty aggressive disease in the CRPC setting. It's very different than low volume, you know, hormone sensitive um, after previous treatment prostate cancer. And I wonder if there's any thoughts from either of you on if you, if they were HRR mutated and you were going to use a PARP in that scenario and say they're having a great response and you even do a PARP and you might do some stereotactic radiation or, or who knows, and I, you know, but say we do those things that are having a great response. Is there any data from other cancers, or is there any thought in your mind that PARP therapy, we might not do it indefinitely, I might do it in these, if they're having a great response, I might withdraw them from that line of therapy. And again, this is a kind of a more unique scenario of this lower volume CRPC progress, progressive patient mm -hmm. that you may be using PARP. So is there any data from other cancers or any thoughts about that? Oh, I'm reaching back to my private practice days, which were a while ago. But um, so I think there is. and and. Don't quote me, but everybody's a urologist, so. Um, 
in using it as, as um, post-ovarian uh, for, for the BRCA mutated women, they had their chemotherapy, and then I think they got a year or two of Olaparib yeah. uh, in early studies you know, eight years ago or, or more. And, you know, obviously time will tell. I mean, I'm, I'm pushing you into hypothetical scenarios that don't have evidence, but I think that, uh, you know, um, there'll be both more evidence up front that develops. Um, these trials are still maturing, obviously. And I think there's going to be a lot of real-world evidence, too, particularly if the FDA is rather permissive with what they allow us as clinicians to do. The question is then what are we doing? And I think that... Uh, um, this idea of like, you know, they're already looking at it even for, you know, our, our ADT and stuff like therapeutic withdrawal in, in some selective patients, you know, makes sense. And then what I'm hoping is something that Dr. Davis touched on uh, somewhat with toxicities. We don't quite understand, we have a firm understanding or a firmer understanding of who's going to have the best bang for their buck efficacy, you know, the BRCA1, 2 folks, and maybe some others that are HR mutated and maybe some that aren't, but we have a much firmer understanding on that then who is going to have terrible toxicity, you know, and, and really um, get beat up with the PARP inhibitors. You mentioned maybe people with public radiation, you know, maybe, maybe some people that have other um, um, warning signs, but I don't think we have a great grasp on, you know, how can we kind of biomarker select or, you know, physically select uh, the patients for it. So as we go to the, you know, kind of the, uh, um, to the post-test questions and leave time for questions, I'll start with Dr. Scarpato. Any closing remarks from, from your end? Yeah, a um, couple. So for, first of all, um, as I started by saying, I think the urologists do have a role in PARP inhibitor therapy for our patients, whether or not we are the ones who are directly prescribing them. And most, much of that, not all of it, but some of it comes vis-a-vis -vis the genetic testing that we talked about. And I don't think that that should be understated. Our patients qualify for somatic and germline testing um, based on their localized high-risk disease or very high-risk disease uh, family history or their metastatic status. And so I think we should be playing a role in making sure that we are following guidelines, identifying some of these actionable mutations, identifying their clinical trial eligibility based on these mutations, um, cascade testing, which we really didn't talk about for family members. And so um, kind of early on, I think urologists, we play an important role in this. And two, the landscape is kind of rapidly changing. And so um, it's exciting, and I am happy that all of you guys are here because many of our patients, unfortunately, will, will progress to this. And so we need to kind of have an understanding of where PARP inhibitors fit in. And because they're orally administered, because they're well tolerated, there may be a day that we're seeing them even earlier. There are like around 50 ongoing clinical trials right now looking at PARP inhibitors. Um, they may move earlier and earlier up in the, in the treatment of our patients. And so um, thank you all for, for being here. And Dr. Davis, any, any closing remarks for you? And then we'll get to some good audience questions. I, I just echo Dr. Scarpato's um, you know, sentiment to get these patients tested early. Um, I think we, we do this well at our academic center, but I think a lot of communities do this well too. And um, urologists and medical oncologists who focus on these diseases um, should be friends and should work and together. Are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's for the benefit of the patient. It's not your patient or my patient, it's our patient. Um, and what can we do to optimize that patient, that man getting, you know, hopefully everything we have to offer over the course of his disease. Absolutely, and, and thank you both for thoughtful discussion and for, and for a good back and forth. We're gonna take questions from the audience. I tried to um, allow for almost 15 or, or, or maybe a little bit more than that minutes of questions because it's a new area for, at least for me, and, um, and there's a lot of nuance, and, and there's more unknown than known, but I think that a lot of us are, are gonna start to use the PARP inhibitors in our practice or refer to MedOncs to use it. Um, so uh, we have the online system, but if people in the room want to ask a question, please feel free to come up to the microphone, and, and myself, Dr. Scarpato, Dr. Davis, will try to do our best to answer. Yes, it's a great question. Just to repeat it, and, and I may pick on Dr. Davis, um, 
you know, for people who are octogenarians or, or I think it's non-engineerians or, or in their 90s, but have, but have um, um, metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer and, you know, you're thinking about a PARP inhibitor because they're, let's say, BRCA1 or 2 mutated or other uh, DDR mutated, you know, what are your thoughts? The trials, I know performance status, the trials I think were mostly ECOG 0 to 1, mm -hmm. so they had a decent performance status. Um, but what are, what are your thoughts? Does that does age matter? Yeah, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, it, it you know it, it it's more performance status than age, uh, and it's more goals of uh, therapy, goals of care than age. So I have sixty year olds that aren't well enough to get chemotherapy. I've given chemotherapy to a ninety nine year old uh, for prostate cancer. I mean, so uh, there are drugs that should be used if the indication is correct. And quite frankly, I can't remember in the trials if there was an age cutoff, you know, um, so. I, I don't think there is yeah. anymore. I think that's politically incorrect. Yeah. Please, Hi, sir. I'm Robert Carey from Sarasota, Florida. We have a large number of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients in our area and a lot of deaths from it. And, you know, the PARP inhibitors have been with us for some time. And so we've had lots of discussions, and I think when people fail their therapies and we have a, a, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, you know, the PARP inhibitors have performed well, but in our t entire tumor board, I don't think we've ever seen a foundation one where it's not BRCA1, BRCA2, but something else that they suggest, you know, that, that, that the PARP, PARP inhibitors could be used. Have you personally seen good responses to any of the other genes, and if so, what were they? We've had a couple at our institution with, with, with Paul B2 for sure, and at least I can remember one patient with a CHECK2 that had a good response. Um, I'll, you know, I'll lean on the Vanderbilt experience in a second, but you know, I'm, I'm often thinking about, or, or about what are some other signs that, you're, you know, that the tumor is actually having an issue with homologous recombination and thus must, might be responsive. And, and I mentioned kind of briefly before, one thing that happens when you don't have good homologous break repair is you get this loss of heterozygosity. And you can, you can measure that both directly by, you know, allelic variants in the DNA and like are you losing, you know, a heterozygosity because like one's dropping off and it's telling you that the break repairs are missing parts of chromosomes. And then more recently there's been some like RNA driven genomic signatures that are available on, on from multiple of the different, uh, um, you know, next gen sequencing companies will give that. In Arial 3, which was an ovarian trial, it sort of worked. It wasn't like as awesome. I mean, I'm, again, this is like, I, I just really operate on prostates and like, so I'm really out of my wheelhouse here. But, but um, I think there might be some other signs, you know, and I think the, there's, it's a biomarker rich area where they, can, where they can pull out and say, well, this person might be more responsive or not. We've had some Paul B2 and CHECK2 responses. I'm not sure if you've had similar experience or not. Yeah, very few. I mean, very few experiences. And um, yeah, and I, I think that and the reality is the frequency of the mutations is you know is lower for those two than than for yeah. for things like BRCA2 and then followed by BRCA1. And the and the main thing is as as you're also pointing out, which is good, is it sounds like you have an operationalized genetic testing uh, regimen. You know, I often am telling men in my clinic when, they're, when they have a diagnosis, I want to know four things. You know, why they have this cancer, how much is in their body, how aggressive, what are we going to do? And why this has, they have this cancer is dependent on their genetics, and it can help us make a roadmap, whether we may stick to it or not, of what is going to be their first line, second line, third line. And even if that's not with me and it's with one of my medical oncologists, you know, that's the way we'll go. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't, yet think in my mind I would give up on everybody in cohort B. You know, I think Dr. Davis said nicely, if there was someone that she was thinking about a PARP in combination, you might even try it early. Um, so I think it should be, you know, still thought about. Um, there is a, a, another question from the remotely that says, uh, do you recommend both germline and somatic testing at the same time or one before the other? Dr. Scarpato, do you want to? Yeah, I think, um First and foremost, it's important to get to them both. Oftentimes, patients will have the germline testing earlier on, um, but I definitely think they can be complementary. And so just because you have a germline test, a foundation one or whatever in vitae that says something, 
um, doesn't mean that the somatic is going to necessarily match up with that or identify the same things. And so um, I do think that getting both in these patients, particularly the, MRC, um, the metastatic castration resistant population, is really important. Um, it's not often that we're getting them simultaneously, but it, it can be based on the patient presentation that that's what we do. Um, certainly for enrollment in these trials, correct me if I'm wrong, patients could have had somatic or, um, in, or um, germline mutations in these. And indeed, some of them even had just circulating free tumor, right. um, you know, mutations, mm -hmm. which is in itself, you know, it, I think a lot of, as the question before said, like a lot of that data has to be really shown to me to see who is a responder and non-responder, whether they you know, were they, were those free, like those cell-free assays, were they really as robust as they might be? Right, yeah. yeah. And they can change over time. I mean, the yeah. guidelines will say, and often at academic centers we will do this. I'm not sure in practice that it's all that um, common, but you can retest for somatic mutations too. So you may have had someone yeah. who had germline and somatic tested, and then there's a change in their clinical status or some suspicion that you're missing a mutation, you can repeat the somatic testing and um, you and, may get a different answer. And Pre to this preferably point, on a new biopsy. On a yeah. new biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And to this point, like, you know, if we look at, as you mentioned earlier, if we look at metastatic prostate cancer as a group, germline mutated um, is going to be about 12%, you know, like DDR mutated um, at the germline level. If you look at metastatic CRPC somatically, it's about 25, 20, you know, a little bit higher percent. And so they're accumulating these mutations, just like you said earlier, over time. Retesting is, is at an absolute, particularly if they went from like M1B, now they're M1C, you know, trying to get tissue, I think, has a lot of efficacy. Um, the cell free DNA things are, um, I think, can be powerful, but I think still have a lot of nuance to them. Um, they asked, uh, what's the role of, and this is a good question, and I may, again, pose this to Dr. Davis, a medical oncologist, but Dr. Capato, feel free. Um, they, one person asked, what's the role of Keytruda, which is you know, a PDL one um, you know, one inhibitor, uh, a PD-1 inhibitor, I'm sorry, in uh, advanced prostate cancer and the indications uh, to give it, if you want to speak towards that. Yeah, so Keytruda or pembrolizumab has an agnostic indication for any um, solid tumor type with high Tumor, tumor mutational burden or uh, microsatellite instability. So it's currently only indicated in prostate cancer for those men who have microsatellite in instability or high TMB, which are extremely rare. Yeah, and it's not, and not zero, but at least um, if I'm remembering the NCCN guidelines correctly, it's it's more preferred as at least a second line in the CRPC space instead of first line. Oh, CRPC. I wouldn't use it first. Yeah, yeah. and the. Um, this is a tough question, and, and again, I know I'm picking on you as a medical oncologist, but it, they ask, like, how do you differentiate between the, you know, um, um, myelothesis, I can't even pronounce it, um, between just anemia from, you know, like, you know, PARP-related anemia and just, you know, myelothesis from, like, other, like, the previous chemo or from, like, previous radiation? What's the differentiator? And I guess from my actual point, too, I would be curious, um, you know, a lot of times the taxateric and the cabazitaxel type um, anemia, the patients seem to, they, they, they rebound a lot of the cases. Is that true with PARP, or can PARP sometimes cause complete, you know, like they just have ongoing anemic problems? They tend to rebound uh, with PARP inhibitors, which is helpful. Um, it's hard to tell the difference. It, you could do retic count, you know, well, you could send your patient to a benign hematologist to do a retic count um, to see if the bone marrow is functional and trying to make blood cells or not. Um, that can be a differentiator. If the retic is appropriately elevated for the degree of anemia, then it's not just scar tissue back there. The gold standard would be to do a bone marrow biopsy, and I think I've done that once in 25 years for prostate cancer. You know, since we've had a, uh, at least one courageous, uh, two courageous um, people in the audience, but since we're not getting a lot of questions to us, I thought I would ask some questions to, to you. Um, how, how many urologists in the audience? Any medical oncologists in the audience? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. The, the, uh, um, how many of the urologists have either given PARP inhibitors in their practice or have had their practice, particularly if you're in the community urology, I've talked to some lugpa groups where they've onboarded this, 
have started to use PARP inhibitors in their, in their, pra in their practice. So some, and, and, and are, are you, um, if you're running your advanced prostate um, um, clinic, and if you wanted to make any comments, well, maybe I'll just pick on you. Um, there's a handful that are giving it. Um, are you mostly giving it in the BRCA mutated patients or all the HRR? Mostly BRCA mutated. It seems like that's the way they're, they're, they're nodding. And have you run into something that you completely did not expect in regards to the agents that you want to share? Good. So it seems, and I do like as the trials have kind of, as there have been more of these trials, I, I do think that the, um, um, the um, intent has been to try to select populations at least for the entry criteria that match a lot of patients we see, you know, and the criticism is primarily in the comparator arm. Like, is the comparator arm, you know, realistic, um, you know, particularly for the lap, for the profound trial, mm -hmm. was comparator arm realistic, you know, for the Caprib trial, at least they, you know, had an option of getting chemo if they had not, you know, got it. Um, so, um, and then another question is, you know, should we use EPO in PARP inhibitor related anemia? Yeah, we don't know. Um, EPO in cancer, for, for cancer related or chemotherapy, antineoplastic related um, anemia has uh, took, took a left turn probably back in 2010 when the study showed that we were giving too much and patients were getting you know, very robust responses and having strokes. Um, so if you, I, just, I just put somebody on EPO this week uh, for lutetium-induced persistent cytopenias. But, um, but if you do it for cancer patients, you cannot go above 10 mm -hmm. as a hemoglobin. Um, so uh, uh, for chronic kidney disease, you have 11 as a threshold that you can treat to 11. But for antineoplastic-related uh, anemias, you can't go above 10 um, based on FDA yeah, and, that's, and, that's and the ESA police. And that's ex excellent in insights. Um, the evening is, is getting a little bit late. I'm trying not to get too punchy, but I love the treat to 11. I like that idea. Some people treat to 10. You can turn it up to 11. If anyone, anyways, so to be back on the uh, um, back in, on on track, let's go over the same questions we had in the beginning and see how we do, and we'll go over the answers to those questions too. So, let's go to the same audience response questions we had before. The guidelines for advanced prostate cancer recommend offering germline testing to men with prostate cancers in what stages or states of disease? A. Men considering active surveillance. B, men with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. C, metastatic, metastatic cash-resistant prostate cancer. D, all the above. Or E, B, and C. Please choose the best answer. So that's excellent. So um, the, the answer is E, which, which about half of the um, attendants got. The guidelines for advanced prostate cancer recommend offering germline testing to men with advanced prostate cancer, hormone sensitive and metastatic. Um, so that's excellent. The, um, for active surveillance, it seems like it went up and then went down. You know, un unless there's specific things about the man's, you know, family history or known, you know, BRCA status in the family, it's, it's not uh, a, recommenda a recommendation at this time. I'm not quite sure. Oh, here's the uh, comparing the pre and post test, and it looked like um, that we might have taken knowledge from you. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but regardless, more than 50% of the audience 
got it right. They probably did the pretest at earlier yeah. time of day. <laughs> so we have question two. Severe, um, severe, so grade three and above side effects attributed to PARP inhibitors include all the following except anemia requiring transfusion, thrombocytopenia, nausea, transaminitis, or neuropathy. All except which one in terms of a severe toxicity? Great. So as, that's perfect. As, as Dr. Um, Davis mentioned, very common side effects are anemia in, in particular, um, and then some GI toxicities. Um, grade three thrombocytopenias, nausea, and transaminase were reported. No grade three neuropathy has been reported across all the different trials in prostate cancer with all the different agents. And um, um, here it looks like everyone did really well. Um, so. The next question is, which of the following, and, and, and this is for a late eating question, you have to put on your thinking caps even to, to read it. Um, which of the following is a good rationale for synergy between the inhibitors of androgen receptor signaling, um, things like the AR inhibitors or CYP17 you know, uh, lyase inhibitors, and PARP inhibitors? Is the reason that this combination might work that AR splice variants are inhibited by PARP inhibitors? that resistance to the AR signaling inhibitors happens by activation of BRCA2 and RB1, that inhibition of the antigen receptor signaling decreases expression of genes associated with DNA damage response, making the cancers more susceptible to PARP inhibitors, or all of the above. Excellent. The most plausible explanation is that inhibition of the antigen receptor um, signaling decreases the expression of some of these DNA damage response genes. And so you can convert, like Dr. Scarpato said, people from sort of being proficient at repairing to being somewhat deficient at repairing and then hit them with the second hit of a PARP inhibitor. You know, for those that chose all of the above, all of the above is always an attractive answer. It's sort of, <laughs> it's sort of my answer to the buffet line. Um, so, next question: Which of the therapeutic combinations has not deve has not shown a progression-free survival benefit for men with homologous recombination to repair deficiency and metastatic CRPC? Is it talizaparib and Enza? Is it olaparib plus Abby? Niraparib plus apalutamide? or niraparib plus abiraterone. Excellent. So um, talizaparib plus enzalutamide was the combination taken forward in the Talapro trial. Uh, Olaparib plus abiraterone was in the Propel trial. Niraparib plus abiraterone was what was used in magnitude. And all those showed progression-free survival benefits among the homologous recombination repair deficient regimens. Niraparib plus apalutamide had too many drug-drug interactions and was not taken forward um, it, into uh, late-phase trials. And that's, and that's good. It's, um, one more post-test question. What best describes 
men who are likely to respond to PARP inhibitors when com combined with antigen receptor signaling inhibitors? Who are the most likely responders? Is it A, all men will respond regardless of their genetics? B, men with mutations in homologous recombination deficient genes will respond regardless of uh, what the gene is? Men with mutations with BRCA1 or BRCA2 would be C, or D, men who have microsatellite instability, so MSI, high men. Great. In choosing the, the best answer, the, the best answer is the men with mutations in BRCA1 and 1 or 2. They seem to be the most likely responders, even in this combination regimen. So as we get towards the end of this program, there's a couple of things that I wanted to say as announcements. First, a huge thank you, Dr. Scarpato and, and, you know, and Dr. Davis for spending this time with us this evening and sharing your insights and knowledge with me and, and the group and the group that's online. So thank you very much. <laughs> the, uh, also to the, to, again, to Pfizer for supporting this program, to the, um, to the AUA in particular for putting on this event. The evaluations are very important to the AUA. So please, you know, um, um, please take your time to do it. You can claim CME credit by going to www.auanet.org backslash AUA2023 backslash CME. Click Claim CME. Enter your AUA ID, last name, and zip code. If you give your evaluations as well, three lucky attendees will, um, will get a $100 um, gift card. Um, explanation mark. Um, <laughs> please. <laughs> Be beyond that, and this is just a general housekeeping thing that I always have to remember, please check the area around you before you depart so you didn't leave anything behind. Um, but really, you know, I think, you know, as was mentioned by one of the participants, um, this class of drug has been around for a, for a while. It's shown high efficacy in other cancers, particularly in the DNA damage re response mutated cancers. I think it's great to have another therapeutic option for a men with prostate cancer. And it's a great win for precision medicine for us to sort of identify who might be a, a more likely responder or not. Where can we push the therapeutic index of, the, of these drugs? I really like, uh, appreciate the turnout in the audience. It's, uh, it's great to have you here, to have you engaged. And again, thanks to my collaborators. And um, have a great rest of the AUA and a great rest of your evening. Thank you.